My name is Scott Knightlick, often known by my screen name Toy Guru, and I am an adult toy collector, but I've also had the fortune of actually working in the toy industry, which has given me a unique perspective. So today I want to talk about packing toys. And why am I showing pictures of Star Wars droids if I'm talking about packing toys? Well, as kind of always, I like to talk about industry issues by bringing them to sort of my personal observation from actually also being a toy collector. And the reason I'm showing you Star Wars droids is because it happens to be one of those sort of subsets of Star Wars action figures that I really like. They come in lots of different shapes, colors, and flavors, but at the end of the day, visually, they look awesome. But it was years before we got lots of droids. In fact, in the Power of the Force 2 line from 95, and I'm talking about the modern line, obviously not the Kenner line from the 80s, we had very, very few droids. You know, we had R2, we had 3PO, and, you know, we, of course, had R5-D4, although he was turned into a very kid-friendly battle tank with, you know, giant blasters and split apart to shoot a missile. And, you know, as far as fans buying authentic toys, this was not even close. In fact, he pretty much got a toy because the vintage Star Wars line from Kenner in the 80s had, he was the only other astromech droid in the line, so that became a nostalgic ploy. But I don't know, when you give the character a split-apart body with missile-firing action, clearly you're also aiming at kids, so it's kind of that whole sofa bed toy thing, which is probably why it didn't work. Well, we still got very few droids as time went on, especially astromech droids, which became one of my favorites to collect. Little did I know how many we were one day going to get. While that Imperial R5 was the next astromech we got, other things like the Entertainment Earth box sets that were giving us uh, all astromech droids was a huge infusion, if you will, into what became a subset of collecting. Now, I am not the world's biggest astromech droid collector, and those who are seem to have an almost unlimited supply to collect these days. But yeah, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, they were few and far between. So if this was your bag baby, well, you didn't have that many options. Disney buying the brand and having a Build-A-Droid component in their parks, obviously, greatly expands on this. What also greatly expanded on Astromix was, well, the prequels, because there were a limited number in the original movies, and new movies meant new droids. In fact, one of the things I really did love about Episode One is the opening scene. Well, actually, no, not that opening scene, but when they're escaping Naboo, I guess, one of the opening space bottles, battles, bottles? Battles. Battle Bottle, Tweedle Beetle, when R2 goes up onto the uh, Queen's ship, which actually came from the radio drama. And that's what I loved about it, was the radio drama set up that this was actually what R2's job is on starships, was to go out on the hull and fix things. So seeing this in Phantom Menace, with a like crew of droids that was designed to fix things, that we first heard about on the radio drama was really cool to me. And one of the things that I loved about you know seeing the droids working on the outside of the ship so, when the ship was released as a toy, I thought about buying it, but I'm like, oh, this is huge, and like, I don't know. But it had an astromech droid in it. It had a red astromech droid, and back then, like I said, we had maybe five or six, if that, astromech droids, and they were probably all R2. So, I mean, obviously, little did I realize how often figures were going to get re-released over the years, and even this red one would get multiple releases, although it was a different combination of parts. The original one that actually came with the Nabu Fighter was a different red R2 unit. I'm sure he has a specific name. Go look it up on Wikipedia, nerds. Anyway, the ship was really cool. It was fun. Eventually, I did sell it. But, or actually probably just donated it to my daughter's school. What am I saying? That would have like cost a huge amount in shipping, and I have no memory of shipping this up, so I must have donated it. But I bought it not for the ship. The ship was cool. It was probably the biggest thing I ever bought just to get the pack-in figure. And that brings me to, I know, gosh, like five minutes into the video and just now getting to the subject. But see, it sometimes requires background to explain the, the allure, why you would do this, why you would buy an entire playset, you know, a playset ship that is a playset, just to get a pack-in character. And the reason is because this, at the time, fell into one of the things I was buying, which was all astromech droids. Of course, I wound up sort of uh, loosening this role, r rule and abandoning entirely after the prequels were pretty much on full speed when I realized I wasn't falling in love with them the way I did the original trilogy. But I still buy toys just to get pack-ins. I do this all the time. As I was noting with Star Wars, I always had rules about how I collected, and I definitely bought all of the original trilogy characters and any major updates, like even getting a photo real facial repaint on the fleet trooper which 
is what happened with the pack-in on this playset that was offered of the uh, Rebel Fleet, or the Rebel Cruiser, the uh, blockade runner hallway, if you will. Everyone, people know what this toy is. Why do I have to explain that? Anyway, the point is I bought this thing just to get the figure and then put the playset away. Sometimes I was lucky with collecting Star Wars when very expensive ships like this Falcon that came with a pack-in of Han and Chewie, but fortunately I already had that Han and Chewie because they'd been released already on single cards. So get out of jail, free card on that one, but I have definitely thrown down my fair share of money on ships, play sets, uh, DVD, pack-ins, who knows, I mean, all sorts of things just to get the figure because I'm a figure completist. I had this Han Solo because he already came on the 30th anniversary card in both shiny gold and silver. Another example is multi-packs. I bought this multi-pack just to get the Jean Grey because I wanted to complete my 1992 Jim Lee animated series X-Men line. And I had to get another Cyclops and another Wolverine to get her. Granted, they were cool, but let's talk about the whole, you know, yeah, kettle black thing. Because if I hate this so much, if it annoys me having to buy a giant spaceship to get an astromech droid or a three-pack to get a Jean Grey, well then why in the world when I was working in the toy industry did I do this all the time? So let's kind of look into that, and really, why is it? So in a collector line, why would I need to pack in Masters of the Universe Classics, a man-at-arms with the battle ram? Well, it's the same reason that they're often packed in at retail. It creates value and play value. So whereas I was encouraged to buy that X-Men pack that had Jean Grey in order to complete my X-Men 1992 collection, and, you know, granted that while I already had Cyclops, I was actually already pre-buying in my head this version if it ever came out. I said, you know, if I ever do him in his bomber jacket, I will totally buy that. You do that too? Like you have sort of figures you've pre-bought in your head? All right. So when you're doing a collector pack-in, like I did with the Battle Ram, why would I do this to collectors if it's something that I don't enjoy? And a big part of it is hitting a specific price point, but also having... Uh, price value for the consumer that includes the adult collector and honestly these toys still have to go through the approval process and being able to explain a collector product in perspective of a standard retail product which is what management is used to hearing 99% of the time and saying oh yes it's a figure and vehicle that's a very traditional toy and it's easier to get things through the system I did deliberately put a figure that not everyone had to have it was an alternate head for Man-at-Arms, but you already had Man-at-Arms. So not as bad as something like this, right? The Rotan with the Skeleton, that was a huge offense because now we put a Army Builder as a pack-in figure. I suppose just an alternate version of Man-at-Arms. Well, there's a story here, too. One, I had left Mattel before this was released, so the release didn't quite go to plan. For those of you living under Iraq, the Rotan is a vehicle from the Vintage line and the Vintage cartoon, flew through the air, etc., etc., well, it came packed for Masters of the Universe Classics with a recreation of the original toy, plus the model kit uh, canopy, as well as a Skeleton figure. So this was part of the uh, total play value, if you will, of the package, where you could get a figure and put it inside. Again, this is how it's sold into management, as it's a complete play pattern. Even though it's an adult collector item, you'd be surprised how being able to frame things like this helps get it through the system. Skeletons were Skeletor sort of minions from the 80s in some of the storybooks. It was a little obscure, but that's what Masters of the Universe Classics was all about, was picking characters from tons and tons of media. And honestly, we'd already done Royal Guards, we'd done Horde Troopers, and even though we'd done Skeletor's robots from the Filmation series, the idea of giving Skeletor sort of ground troops was a big part of what we wanted to do in Classics, was do army building, because that's such an adult collector way of buying. All right, so getting back to the point is then why in the world pack in a character that should be bought in multiples with a vehicle? That's like the ultimate offense, right? It's not just packing in a figure, but now you're packing in a figure that people want to buy multiples of just the figure, and they don't necessarily want multiples of the, the uh, expensive vehicle, more or less. So this seems like, boy, talk about, you know, again, paint calling the uh, kettle black. Here I am doing the, the worst possible thing. Well, that's the thing the plans were changed. So Skeletons, while the you know army builder of Skeletor's forces, and Rotons definitely being justifiable to also buy in bulk because they were shown in quite a few media as being, you know, it's not like one Roton, not like there's, you know, there's only one Talon fighter, if you will, but Rotons could be, you know, a fleet of Rotons. 
So essentially, the figure did come out as originally planned. Even though he was a pack-in, uh, there was a single card release that was planned. The idea was the figure was supposed to be tooled with two holes in his back. And you would get it and be like, well, that's odd. Why are there holes in the back? And that's because there was going to be a single release of the Skeleton that would come with the wings that were added in the mini comics. This way, if you wanted to buy them in bulk, you could buy the single release, and you could simply just not plug the wings in, and then you have a uh, you know a regular non-winged version. That's why we put winged and non-winged versions in the mini comic was setting this up. It was a long-term uh, sort of road to this release. It was you know multiple stages. The first release with the Rotan, and then that would be followed up with a single release where he would get wings and new accessories, and then simply you would pull the wings out if you didn't want winged versions, or you could customize with wings. It was That's the whole point of an army builder, is to give multiple display options. So that was the solution, was basically either packing in figures that fans didn't have to have, like a Man-at-Arms variant, or if it's an army builder, there were plans to release it as a single, and with even more parts. And when I saw this didn't happen, I was like, no, con! You know, it's like, ugh, gosh, all that planning, all that work, setting up the winged versions, only to not have it happen. So in the end, really, the answer is price value. Whether it's a collector item or a kid item at retail, pack-in figures are done to create the perception of more value, but more importantly, they're there to create play patterns. And sometimes getting things approved by management, even if it's meant for adults online and not for kids at retail, requires a play pattern to sort of speak the language. If you look at something like My First Batmobile, which was a great toy, but it didn't include a Batman. He was sold separately. And this became a big issue because when you're buying the Batmobile and it doesn't include the figure, you don't get the play pattern. It's why you see other Batmobiles from Mattel after this kind of always coming with a Batmobile. And the VP that was over this line, that was over or over the Super Friends line, that was there during the whole doesn't include a Batman, was also the VP I was pitching to on the battle ramp. So I kind of knew that he understood the value of figure plus vehicle. And if I was going to get this approved through the system, I better do a pack-in to mimic the retail play value that a pack-in gives. So, as much as it frustrates me to do pack-in figures that you can only get, there are times when it's required to be able to navigate the system and get the product to market. Hope you enjoyed this video and it was a little insight into pack-in vehicles, the anger, the love, the agony, the ecstasy. Leave your comments. Let me know what pack-ins you've bought for just the figure and thrown out the main item. Curious what you have to say. Leave your thoughts in the comments below and thanks for watching.